Yeah, so first of all, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. And it's been a great pleasure to come here. And to thanks to Atreya, Professor Atreya, for providing the introduction. And uh, another, of course, great pleasure is to know that this was a college where uh, Dani studied. So I'm very happy to be. I heard. <laughs> Not quite, yeah. okay. I, I, I was trying to confirm today morning women. <laughs> but anyway, Dani studied in the city, grew up in Belgaum. I think even my uncle was here in Belgaum long, long back as a customs officer. So, so it's great to be here and thanks for the uh, Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, introduction to periodic methods and arithmetic. Uh, I hope the first part, I don't want it, uh, uh, meaning it for the students and not for the first three rows. So I hope it will be uh, accessible. So we'll start off uh, something. So the, the so number theory uh, is extremely vast and one of the main aspects of number theory, uh, in some sense, I would say it's the heart of number theory, though probably Dani might disagree. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry? I spoke on Oh, you spoke on Daifantini. Yeah, right, right, of course. How do you read the universe? Yeah, but it's a, uh, the, the questions are vast, and uh, uh, what I'm going to follow is uh, one particular historical, slightly based on historical approach, is to study of integral equations to polynomial equations with integral positions. Okay, so let's start with the primary example. Uh, the solutions to the Pythagoras equation x squared plus y squared equal to z squared in integers was known to civilizations. I think Sumerians knew it 4000 years back. They had a list of 60 uh, numbers, examples. And uh, you have this, all these examples which we all know from school days or whatever it is. Or maybe we have seen some of these examples. And uh, so, so these were there. And this is one equation one can solve it explicitly, one of the few equations one can solve it explicitly, but I am not going to go into the solutions, but it, uh, it's fairly uh, nice to know the solutions. Then, uh, you know, you come back more recent times, uh, more than 1000 years back, or 1400 years back, Brahmagupta studied the Pell's equation, x squared minus dy squared equal to 1, and for d a natural number, so for many of us, uh, to learn number theory, these are supposed to be the units of the real quadratic field. And uh, so it's always a bit of a surprise that uh, uh, why uh, Brahmagupta was interested in learning these things, but maybe there are other reasons. Okay. And then, uh, very recent times, uh, for 20 years back, while some Taylor Wiley showed that there are no non trivial integral solutions to the Thoma equation x power n plus y power n for equal to z power. Of course, Fermat himself did it for n equal to 3 and 4, and for other primes, you know, other things, uh, many other people had done contributions, but this was a very basic thing. Okay. And uh, now there are, uh, there's one question which I'll just say, the question of which natural number is n. So if you take a right angled triangle, and the sides are on rational lengths, then the, you want to know which n occur as the area of a right angle triangle with rational signs. So you base the height and the hypotenuse on are to be rational and uh, then you want to know which numbers occur as the area of a right angle triangle and that uh, amounts to solving what is called an elliptic equation, a cubic equation, y squared equal to x cubed minus nx, whether this has solutions in non-zero integers, uh, in integers with non-zero y, y should be non-zero. So, so this is what, uh, whether there is such a solution in non-zero So, So there are many such questions which have come up in, uh, naturally, some of them very ancient and some of them are very recent, this is why this thing is very, uh, one of the major inputs in mathematics in the last maybe 30-40 years, it just revolutionized uh, these aspects of number theory, the proof of this question. Okay, so now I'll come back to uh, uh, question which Fermat started. So from Fermat, is it uh, that side is getting cut off a bit? Is it uh, possible or why is it? So it's going to be like that only. 
Okay, anyway, it doesn't matter. Just one character. Yeah. Just one character. Yeah. Just one character. Yeah. studied uh, which numbers can be written as a sum of uh, two squares, x squared plus y squared equal to yeah. yeah. Okay, so then there is a Brahmagupta diaphragm test identity, which was used by Brahmagupta while solving the Pell's equation, which is if you take two numbers which are product of squares, uh, which are sums of squares, and take the product, then that can also be written as a sum of two squares. Now, if we write it in terms of a plus ib into a minus ib, c plus ib into c minus ib, so that is what the left hand side is, and that is equal to, you can take a plus ib into c plus ib and take the norm there, or the absolute value square. Okay, so that it can be said in that way, but so now, because if you know that, uh, if you write, uh, if, if you know that two, no, two numbers are a sum of two squares, then the product is also a sum of two squares. Then you think of it in the reverse and you say, first let me solve it when n is a prime. Which numbers, which prime numbers can be written as sum of two squares? So this was what Thoma uh, studied and he hit a jackpot in this. So, this. so now you can start off by saying that the primes 3, 7, 11, 19, 23, they cannot be expressed as sum of two squares. You know, what are these numbers? These are numbers which, prime numbers which leave a remainder 3 upon dividing by 4. 3, 7, 11, 19, 23. I have just written down the first one. Okay, so this is seen from the fact that if you take a square, right? If you take a square, say it's either, if you take a number, it's either 2k or 2k plus 1. Okay, if I take 2k square, then it gets divisible by 4, it leaves a remainder 0. And odd number, if I square it, it becomes 4k square plus 4k plus 1, and it leaves a remainder 1 right upon dividing by 4. So if you add two such numbers, then the, num the set of remainders which you will get are 0, 1 and 2 modulo 4, right? Whereas what you uh, what you want is, the, so the primes common to 3 modulo 4 cannot be expressed as a sum of two squares, okay? So this is uh, somewhat uh, easy to see that the primes common to 3 modulo 4 cannot be, in fact numbers n common to 3 modulo 4 cannot be written as sum of two squares. This is general, but in particular for primes. So, I will claim the proof of the converse. So, which is that you prime p congruent to 1 mod 4. So, p equal to 2, of course, can be written as sum of 2 squares, it's 1 square plus 1 square. But take, I should not say it's a proof of the converse, I should say the uh, uh, logically that's not correct. I should say that Thoma showed that the other set of primes which are naturally left out always can be written as sum of 2 squares. So, for suppose you take 41, 5 is, of course, 2 square plus 1 square. If you take uh, some number like 13 is 3 square plus 2 square, but you can take other numbers, I just took some examples. If you take 41 is 25 plus 16, 73 is 64 plus 9, 89 is 64 plus 25, 113 is 64 plus 49 and so on. Okay, so you can write this as a sum of two squares. So it's a very, uh, what I would say is, it's a non-linear problem, right? Now you are trying to write whether a number can be written, what, maybe you have to write down the squares, the squares seem sparse, the distance between them grows as uh, kind of n, uh, linearly or not, quadratic growth of the numbers. And you would like to uh, add two such numbers, but then you seem to be saying, and the primes are again very random, prime p, the primes congruent to 1 mod 4 or whatever, you just generally the set of primes is very random, you can't give a, formula or you can't predict, it's a kind of very, very random. Okay, so, and this is a quadratic thing, problem, and the solution is extremely elegant. You know, it's a very, very simple solution that Thelma goes on to assert, okay, so that 113, you know, that the primes congruent to 1 mod 4, you take any prime congruent to 1 mod 4, you can delete it as some of this. Then just take any prime, whatever you feel like it, just check it out and you will see that. So Fama, of course, immediately realized that he is on something very non-trivial and then he goes on to study other such forms. So he looks at forms of the form x squared plus 2y squared. If and only if p equal to 2 or p is congruent to 1, 3 mod 8. Okay. So that is 1. And then, um, wait. And for prime p equal to x squared plus 3y squared, if and only if either prime p is 3 or p is congruent to 1 mod. So the left hand side, as I say, is 
you know, you are talking about crimes which are, so you behave, have some very random behavior, you are trying to write it in terms of some quadratic uh, values of some quadratic polynomial, which is a quadratic phenomenon, but on the other hand, the right hand side has an extremely simple solution just in terms of remainders. Oh, sorry? Mod 3. There is a typo in the last line. Not mod 3. The last mod 3. Mod 3. Mod 3. Mod 3. Mod 3. The very last term. P is 3 or P is 1 mod 3. P equals 3 or 3. No, no. P equals 3 is 1 mod 3. No, no, no. It should be P equals 1 or 7 mod 3. Mod 3 is 1 mod 3. Which one? X squared plus 3 y squared? 2 y squared. One mod three is correct. No, no, uh, one or three mod eight. Because see, you can write when x equal to one, you get one, and uh, uh, x is zero and uh, uh, y x and y are one mod, you get three. No, no, this is minus two. This is a common formula for minus two is this point. Minus two is this point. No, no, this is fine. You just check it for one and three. Is it mod? Not p is three or one mod three. So the restriction on x and y is that x and y have to be integers. X, x and y are uh, integers and they will have to be of course co-prime. No. So I will have to say co-prime integers. Yeah. So they have to be positive integers. Ah, sorry? Positive integers. It doesn't matter. Even also negative also is square. I am taking square. So it oh, it's square. Yeah. Would <laughs> be zero. No, zero will not work because uh, uh, p zero is a prime. Zero. So. Zero is prime. Why can be zero and Right, yeah. it's a prime, so... So that is the word then, P will be 1. P will be 1. P is 1 is not a prime, so it's 1. Yeah, is that okay? Is this okay for... Let's see, you can try some numbers. Let me, I'll give some examples. 67 is... Uh, I've written it as, it's 3 mod 8. Okay, so you can write it as 7 squared plus 2 into 3 squared. 7 squared is 49 and 3 squared is 9, so 49 plus 18 is 67. 31 is also, uh, 31 is uh, what? What did I say? It's 3 mod 8. 4 plus. No. 27 plus 4. 20, 2 squared plus 3 into 3 squared. Yeah, 3 squared. 1 mod 3. 1 mod 3, sir. 1 mod 3. 30, 31 is 1 mod 3, so it is. I have written it as 2 squared plus 3 into 3 squared. Hmm. 97 is uh, again 1 mod 3. 1 mod 3. Yeah, 96. 1 mod 3. And I wrote written it as 4 squared plus 3 into 3 squared. You can, you can just check it. It's a very nice exercise. You will see uh, how uh, interesting it is to keep writing these numbers and work it out. And then you see this pattern is actually true on the nodes. You know, it's really very nice to do it. Mathematically, experimentally, and you will appreciate then what the scale is. Okay, the pattern keeps co continuous but keeps getting mysterious. P equal to x squared plus 5y squared, if and only if p is common to 1, 9, 1, 1, 20. There are some two other numbers which are should not occur, which are 3 and 7, but they don't occur. It's only 1, 9, 1, 20. P equal to x squared plus 6y squared. If and only P is common to 1, 7, 1, 24. You would think that it's going to work all the time. But there is no such criteria in terms of congruences for price of the form x squared plus 26 y squared. Okay. So, point is that for such, when I take n equal to 26, you, that, is, that does not exist in criteria in terms of congruences. Okay. So, you can give many other numbers for which, in fact, most of the numbers you are not going to get a very nice criteria in terms of congruences as you keep going. You are getting it only in terms of small numbers. Yeah? So, I should say the history was that Fermat got this problem maybe in the 1630s or 1640s. 100 years later, Euler, when he was young, he got to hear about these uh, questions, x squared plus y squared. And he wanted to know what other examples Fama had. Fama had 1, 2, 3 and up to 5. Beyond that, I don't know whether he had much. And many of these other examples was Euler spent the rest of his lifetime 
looking up this examples and many other examples. That is one about x squared plus 27 y squared, another about x squared plus 64 y squared, where instead of a linear congruence, there is a cubic congruence and fourth, fourth power congruence. Is but uh, Euler spent the rest of his lifetime interested in trying to figure out the examples. And only towards the end of his career, he figured out what should be considered. Okay. Okay, so let's say the Fermat's method of proof is via infinite descent, reverse engineering the Brahmagupta identity. You try to first show that the prime P congruent to 1 mod 4 divides a number which is a sum of two squares which are co prime. That, that exists, that exists two in co prime integers xy, so that x squared plus y squared is congruent to 0 mod p, which in place x squared is congruent to minus y squared mod p, and you know, when you have x and y are co prime, so y can be inverted mod p, that is an inverse by the inflation of the So you get x by y squared is congruent to minus 1 mod p. So this is, that minus 1 is x squared. Okay. And here we have used the fact that set of integers mod p, fp is a finite field, z mod p is a Okay. Yeah, so that's a, uh, so this is a, and then, then there is a reverse engineering. So you like to show, show that uh, when a prime congruent to 1 mod 4, then minus 1 is a square mod p. And here in this case what one knows is that this uh, phi or uh, one can solve it uh, fairly easily by looking at polynomial equations over the field, it will have as many rooms as the degree. And uh, when p is congruent to 1 mod 4, uh, so the, uh, the number of elements which of so the in a p star or non zero elements is, is p minus 1 and 4 divides p minus 1, and so you will have a fourth root of 1, which is possible because the number of English solutions have to be. At least four solutions have to be there for x power 4 equal to 1 and they cannot all be x squared equal to 1 because x squared equal to 1 can have only two solutions. So there has to be a proper solution of x power 4 equal to 1. And or you can use the fact that fp is a field. So if p star is uh, 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 one knows it's cyclic and then then there is and since 4 divides p minus 1, there is always this element whose square fourth power is minus 1. See if some square is minus 1 mean it's we are basically saying that you can realize whatever we know as a complex number i in some sense it realize on fp for p congruent to 1. So one has to show that prime is congruent to 1 mod 4, then minus 1 is a square mod. That's the kind of reciprocity which is required to show. That minus 1 is a square mod p, mod the p if and only p equal to 2, or p is congruent to 1 mod 4. Right? This is what I was saying. In particular, in place. you start off by this. This is the starting point for Fermat. And then, so minus 1 is a square mod p means p divides some number of the forms k squared plus 1. And then he uses infinite descent, which means you do the, try to solve the Brahmagupta, uh, the Diophantus Brahmagupta equation in the reverse way. A similar statement goes for n equal to minus 2 and minus 1. Okay. Now what, what I am saying is, it is this statement that generalizes for all n. Which, which this statement I am saying, it is this statement. The first, that minus 1 is a square mod p, if and only p is 2 or p is 1 to 1 mod. Again, you can say that uh, minus 2 is a square mod p, if and only if p is congruent to 1, 3 mod 8. Or minus 3 is a square mod p, if and only if p is congruent to 1 mod 3. Okay, so these are the things which you get for the solution. It is this statement that generalizes for all n, yielding a coarse quadratic reciprocity statement of Euler, Legendre and Gauss. So as I said, Euler got to this around the end of his lifetime, the quadratic reciprocity law. What is the law? He did not get a proof. Legendre claimed a proof, but people are not convinced of it. And Gauss, at the age of 17 or 18, he came along, he discovered the quadratic reciprocity law and proved it. Okay, so that's no time gap between discovery and proof for Gauss. <laughs> and at the very end age of 18 minutes. Yeah. Okay, fix a square free integer n. So what is the theorem? Then the set of primes p congruent to co prime to 4n for which n is the square mod of p. That means same as p divides x square minus n y square. 
x y equal to 1 uh, are given by a collection uh, here it is minus n but when I take x squared minus n by squared are given by a collection of congruence classes for the form. See this is if p divides x squared minus n by squared you know co-prime integers that means you know n is a square mod p means p divides n squared plus 1 that's all you want. Uh, sorry, n divides, uh, yeah, x squared minus n. n is a square mod p is enough to say x squared minus n, but you can uh, basically this is also enough. Yeah, it's not same as that, but it is. Okay, so this is the left hand statement which you want to say, but they are given by a collection of congruence classes modulo 4 a. And quadratic reciprocity tells precisely what congruence classes should be. But, so what? To go back, you can't get solutions of x squared plus n by squared. There is no such very nice pattern. That is a pattern. You can describe the law, but it's a very complicated law to describe. Whereas, instead of looking at exact values, you try to look for uh, divisibility. You look, try to look for divisibility where the p divides some values of the quadratic form x squared minus n by squared. Okay, that has a much better behavior. And it has a very nice solution, which is in terms of problem in this So thus, it is better to study divisibility properties than exact representability. And this marks the beginning of the study of congruences. Why you want to look at remainders? Of course, remainders, you look at clock arithmetic, you know, carrot arithmetic, you want to see predict seasons, you want to predict, you know, the month, which days of the month, you know, whatever you want your data to see, you know, to see, whatever it is, various days or anything, Tuesday. So you use standard arithmetic and use congruence, but that is for very simple things. But in terms of number theory and arithmetic, this is the first place where you see that studying divisibility properties, you probably end up with better theorems and more correct theorems. And later on, you can study other phenomena using this. But you can use it. So quadratic reciprocity, as I said, tells you precisely when congruence classes, which congruence classes model for in Yeah. Okay. So let's just for fun, uh, as I said, this is not for through the discovery of Pythagoras that root 2 cannot be a rational number. Of course, for the Greeks, every, everything has to be rational. They are logicians or whatever uh, rationalists, what you might say, which is a wrong word to say, but uh, it's a rational number. But uh, and then they were very uh, uh, surprised to see that a number like square root of 2, which you can construct because it exists, you can take a square of size 1 and then the diagonal as length square root 2. But, uh, and so they expected it should be a rational number, but it's not. And that also supports it. So if there is a solution x y y squared equal to 2 and x and y have no common factors, where x and y are natural numbers, then x squared equal to 2 y squared. Okay? So you go modulo 3, this gives x squared is congruent to minus y squared because 2 is congruent to minus 1 mod 3. Okay, 2 plus 2 minus minus 1 is 2 plus 1, which is 3, and 3 is 0. So x squared is congruent to minus y squared mod 3, and 3 cannot divide y. Alright? As it will also divide x, but uh, uh, because 3 denotes y means y squared is 0, so x squared, so 3 will also divide x. Okay, but then minus 1. So, so I can divide by y, so then I get minus 1 is square mod 3, and that is not possible. Okay, so this is it. A similar argument serves to rule out the existence of rational solutions to the equation x squared plus y squared equal to 3. Now, again, or integral solutions of the equation x squared plus y squared equal to 3 is x squared. Again, a very similar argument. You can first rule out the fact that uh, 3, you know, and, uh, if 3 divides, y then 3 will also divide x but uh, you know you can assume these numbers are co-primed by x, y, z by clearing out common factors but if 3 divides both x and y then 9 should divide x squared and 9 should divide y squared which means 3 should divide z which means 3 divides all x, y, z and that is not possible. So by looking at just the divisibility properties by 3 you can rule out the solutions for this equation very necessary conditions you can rule out. Yeah? So if there is, okay, so this is a kind of necessary condition. If there is an integral solution to a polynomial equation, more generally for, for a system of polynomial equations, suppose if x squared plus y squared equal to 3z squared has a solution, then it has to have a solution 
that same solution will be true mod by n. I can divide all that z mod nz, it will always be true. Because the, so in SN condition, I am stating it again. For the existence of integral solution of polynomial equation is that there exists solutions mod by n for every natural number n. Because if there is an integral solution, then it gives you a solution mod by n for every natural number. This is basically the fact that the map from z to z mod nz is a ring homomorphism. So if you have solutions in z, it will also give you solutions in z mod nz for every one. Okay. Right? So is that okay? This is a very necessary condition. So one of the major aspects of number theory is to say whether the converse holds. Okay, and before that I will uh, come to this. Since we are looking at Z mod and Z, I will say given two corporate natural numbers M and N, Euclid's algorithm gives the existence of numbers U and V so that M U plus N V equal to so you take this numbers A and B, the numbers C equal to MUV plus NVA satisfies the congruence. So if you go mod M, then NV is congruent to 1 mod. When you go mod M from the first equation, NV equal to 1 mod M. And I'm multiplying by A, then C is congruent to A mod M. And when you go mod N, C is congruent to B mod M. Right? This is the, from this equation, you get NV equal to 1 mod M. And one can show that this is a unique integer order. Now this gets reflected as what is called the Chinese remainder theorem. So the Chinese remainder theorem states, you take the prime quartization of the natural number, then the decomposition, so z mod nz to the product of z mod p to the power, oh, so this should be pi to the power ei, uh, so this index i is missing, z is an isomorphism of rings. Okay, so here I have shown that every such, this map is subjective, this above argument says that every element out here can be captured by an element out here, but what one can further see is that there is a natural map from Z mod Nz to each of these rings, so there is a natural map, projection map from here to here, and this is an isomorphism. Okay, it respects multiplication and addition. Okay, so, and it's an isomorphism. It respects multiplication and addition is basically saying that it's all projection maps which are natural. Okay. Since polynomials involve only addition and multiplication, again I'm restating the same thing which I stated last slide. A necessary condition for a system of polynomial equations or integers to have an integral solution, non-trivial if it is a system of homogeneous equations, is that, that homogeneous means that the, all the monomials involved are the same thing. Is that there exist solutions in Z mod P to the power K Z for every prime P and every natural number K. Okay. So these are all maps Z mod P to the power K plus what Z to Z mod P K Z to Z mod P Z. Okay. So I'm going to, since I said I'm going to periodic methods and arithmetic, so I thought I would jump the gun and introduce periodic numbers slightly early on. So periodic numbers are, uh, you know, they have all been used to real numbers, which are, you know, in some sense, you know, you are looking at the reals, the rationals, but like square root 2 is a real number which is not a rational number. So you try to attach various other numbers and complete Q. So there is, either you can take Cauchy's theorem or uh, uh, completeness using Cauchy sequences or using Dedekind cards or whatever, or you, you try to construct the set of real numbers and one shows that it is complete as a metric space. That is the main property which is required. And what is happening out here is that uh, there are other completions of the rationals which are possible and they are all indexed by the prime numbers P. Okay. So that is what is happening and they are called the periodic numbers. But I can, one can think of it from that point of view which I will come to it in a matter of a few slides. But here, what is happening is I am coming to it from the point of view of number theory. So, if I have these integers which is left hand side, I am interested in solutions over integers. This is my primary object. Right? But Z, that is, when I divide by p to the power k plus 1, I map to Z mod p to the power k plus 1. I can further divide 
by another p and I go to z naught p to the power k, right? And so on, and I and this, so I get, go up to z naught p z, right? What I am interested in, if I have a integer, then it gives me a, a coherent sequence of elements out here. I will get an element a k, which is in z naught p to the power k plus one z, and which will map to its reduction in in mod p power k will map to this. So, if, so what we do is an integer gives me a coherent sequence of numbers here. A k belong to z mod p to the power k plus one z, so that a k is congruent to a k minus one. If I take this element a k here and push it from here, then it is congruent to a k minus one, right? So this is what is called a set of PID integers, okay? Right? So this is in some sense a completion of integers with respect to the p, right? This that is what is very. The analysis is much easier than real numbers. Many other things are much easier. It's a one kind of thing. Okay, and integer m defines the periodic integer, which is what I've said so far. By defining a k is just the remainder of m mod p to the power k plus one. Okay, and that is what. And that all is so is going to satisfy this this point. Okay, the collection of periodic integers it forms a ring under component wise addition and multiplication because components are this so I can these are rings and this maps are ring homomorphisms so taking product of two elements then map it out here will, will, will be product of two the addition of two elements will be addition of two. so they will all form a ring so if you have two coherent sequences then the addition will also be component wise addition will also be a coherent sequence and multiplication will also be a coherent sequence so you get what are called, so they form a ring under this. And what we think, we think of this AK, I can think of it as integers mod P. I will think of this AK as being very periodically close. What we are looking at is divisibility properties. Okay. We are not looking at distance in the sense of traditional distance when we are looking at periodic matrix. What two numbers are said to be close if the difference is divisible by a high power of P. Two integers are periodically close if the difference is divisible by a high power. Okay, so that is what one is looking at. So the components a k are periodically close to a, where whatever is a periodic integer. In that, the various if I take a minus a k, then that means it will become zero out here, right? So which means it is divisible by actually p to the power k plus one because of this, but it's divisible. So that's what one is looking at. Now I can take an integral representative for a periodic integer. So I can look at, I know, I start off with A0, A0 is, uh, AK is C0 plus C1P plus C2P square plus CK P power K. Okay, so A0 is C0, A1 is C0 plus C1P, okay, and A2 is C0 plus C1P plus C2P square and so on. So this is what you get. So and each one of them, so when I truncate, so if I take this number, when I truncate, mod p power k minus 1, I get the previous number mod p power k. So this is what a k is. Okay, so in some sense a periodic number is very easy to see. A periodic integer is being uh, represented by a kind of power series, but instead of x, you are putting t. Okay, c0 plus c1p and I am giving a set of representatives, ci which between 0 and okay, that's So that's exactly. Okay, I, I seem to have said it, I was cut and paste does not work well. A periodic integer can be thought of in analogy with the power series C0 plus C1. Okay. Quite that way, but it is the algebraically also it is the same process. It's what the power series is a completion of the polynomial ring with respect to the ideal x. Okay, and, and its powers x power k. So this is completion of z with respect to the ideal p z. So you have this. Okay, so now I am going to give you an example of a periodic number, which is not the obvious one. So let us see, I have given integers, you see, there are other ones. Suppose n is an integer which is not divisible by p. Okay, then my claim is that n is invertible in zp. It is, it is, it defines a integer in zp. It defines a periodic integer. So this can be seen from Euclid's algorithm. 
n is not divisible by p, so n and p power k are slope prime. So, so you have integers a k n plus y k times p to the power k plus 1 equal to 1. So, which means what? When I go for p power k plus 1, a k n is equal to 1. So, n is invertible model. So, this is what is saying. By construction, the various numbers a k plus 1 is found out to a k n by p power k plus 1. Then this defines inverse n. So, any integer n which is not divisible by p becomes a p adic integer. Okay? It is not immediately obvious, but you need equally solve one to see it. Okay. So, now I am going to give you a different way of looking at uh, p adic numbers starting as completions of rationals. So, I will soon come back to some concrete applications. Please bear with me for some time. But this is, I think, very important to know uh, the periodic numbers and periodic integers. It's kind of been central to number theory. Uh, I, I think quite a bit, and the importance is only increasing day by day. Almost all important mathematical science, whether it's Weitzers or many of Ramanujan's conjectures, all need the use of periodic integers. So that is uh, different way of we start off with an absolute value of rationals as follows. Okay, what is it? So we define the absolute value of zero to be zero. If x is non-zero, you write it as you take the p power r out and write it as u by v, where p does not divide both u and v. And define the absolute value of x is one by p power r. See, I told you that. Uh, Two numbers are close. If x is, has to be close to zero, and is divisible by if r is goes larger and larger, then x should be periodically close. So then the periodic absolute value of x should be close to zero. So that so this is why we put it as one upon p power r. If r goes if r is ten, then it's one upon p to the power ten. So as r goes up to infinity, then x goes off the absolute value of x goes to zero. So this is called the valuation, Vpx is called the valuation, Vpx is R. The valuation Vpx can be thought of in analogy with the valuation defined on meromorphic function. Suppose you have a meromorphic function on the complex plane, then you can you can look at the order of its vanishing or pole, order of zero or pole at, at any point. So this is like P is a point, the prime P is a point, and you are looking at X, it's like a meromorphic function. And I am looking at the order of divisibility of the meromorphic function. Here you are looking at the order of divisibility of z minus k, uh, sorry, of uh, here w minus z, where z is a point. So that is what one is looking at. Now the periodic absolute value has the following properties non negativity, which is, which is what is there, multiplicativity, what can easily say p to the power r times u power v times p to the power r dash, you can check that out. And the last thing is triangle inequality. Okay. So the triangle inequality is stronger. Usual triangle inequality is x plus mod y should be less than or equal to x power p plus y power p. But here it is not that. It is stronger. It is less than or equal to the maximum of x by p and y by p. Okay. You can check that out. It is not too difficult. And this defines a metric on q with distance is x minus y. So two numbers are close, but only if they are kind of highly divisible by p. If I restrict it to the integers, this is what is happening. So the distance set belongs to the set p to the power z because I told you what the distance, you know, it is all 1 by p power r is all that happens. Right? So, so the distance set belongs to p minus 2p inverse p p squared. It's a distance. So this is something, so it's what is called a discrete valuation, discrete absolute value. So the completion of Q with respect to this metric, so given a space and given a metric, uh, metric, you can complete it by looking at equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. And two Cauchy sequences are equivalent if the union gives you a Cauchy sequence. And it gives you a complete metric space called the space of periodic metric. And now, the absolute value extends by continuity. And uh, since it's a discrete set, the absolute value for Q P also takes values in P to the power Z. It does not please. And uh, one can check because Q is a field and you are completing it. It is not too difficult that Q P is also a field and the multiplication and addition maps are continuous. It becomes a topological field, but one will uh, 
you know, much stronger is no, we will see everything is. Okay, now I want to relate the definition of periodic numbers I started off early for rationals with integers I started off and I want to say, uh, I want to get back to that. Okay, since the value set is discrete, now x minus a less than or equal to p power k and x minus a is less than or equal to p power k plus epsilon for epsilon sufficiently small or equal, these two sets are equal. Okay, so what does it mean? This means the first set is a closed set. Okay, if I fix an a and take all the set of all x, that's a closed set because it's less than or equal to given by equality. The second set is an open set. So every point has a neighborhood basis consisting of open and closed sets. So the topology is terrible, it's not like reals, it's totally disconnected. Okay, it's a totally disconnected topology, it's just somewhat like counter set or whatever, it is totally disconnected. Now I want to claim that the set O, which is the set of uh, elements with absolute value less than or equal to 1, is equal to the ring of ZP of periodic integers. Okay? So I have a different description. I have already described you ZP very explicitly as a set of coherent sequences of Z mod P to power KZ, where each one of them maps to the other's mod. So first of all, since Q is dense in QP, O intersection rationals will be dense in O, you know, whatever is this. Uh, and consists of rational numbers whose absolute value is at most 1. So they are of the form U upon V. U and V are integers. But P cannot divide V. P divides V, then it will be 1 upon P is the valuation. So P divides V, the valuation will be P, which is greater than 1. It goes to the inverse. So, so the V is coparent to P. But I have already shown that prime integers coparent to V are periodic integers. So V and thus can be periodically approximated as much as we want by an integer. Because it's a periodic integer, I can take its inverses AK, which I define and they give you periodic approximation to 1 upon g by an integer. Okay. So this means that this shows that z is density. Okay, so I have shown that the integers, this the set of elements whose absolute value is less than equal to 1, the set of integers is actually dense. That means they can be approximated by integers up to the periodic distance which is divisibility by p. It is not the usual distance. Is divisible to pi. But then z is dense in O, so Pz is dense in PO, and the cosets of Pz in Z are dense in the cosets of PO in O. Right? But then what do you get? You get that O mod PO is isomorphic to Z mod PZ. Okay. That's the cosets are the number of cosets of Z, Z in P, Pz in Z is Z mod PZ, and O mod PO is. So that means given an element a in O, there exists an element a naught in Z, so that a minus a naught is in P O. Right? I have element a in O, I can modify it by an element Z, and then a minus a naught becomes P O. Right? So which is that? Because Z is continuous in O. This process can be continued and we get integers a k so that a minus a naught plus a1 p plus a2 p square plus a k belongs to p power k plus one. So same process. So this says that O consists of periodic integers. Every element in O is a periodic integer. Yeah? Okay. So now I want to say something more about periodic integers. I'll just say this. I hope some of it this is it's uh, as I said, it's very important if you are interested in number theory arithmetic, but I'll give you examples later. ZP so another thing is, I, I am looking at ZP, by definition it is contains a product of integers Z1 P to the power K Z. Because it is coherent sequence. It is not all sequences of numbers here, but those which are, which project to each other in a very consistent manner, consistent sequences. The right hand side is a product of finite sets and is compact with respect to the product topology by taken off okay. And you can see that ZP is a closed subset in this, because the projections are all defined by some projections being equal. And when each Z1 P power KZ is equipped with a discrete topology. So what you get is that ZP is compact. Because it's, it's a closed subset of a compact set, this is compact house law, it's closed subset, so it is compact. And the sets P to the power KZP are also compact. 
So the sets a plus p to the power k z p gives a basis of neighborhoods for a plus p. So q p is what is called a locally compact field. Just like real numbers is also locally compact, the periodic integers are locally compact. And what one can do, so as soon as you see locally compact, one knows that there is a Fourier analysis can be done. So a lot of modern number theory, right from trying to understand Ramanujan's work on tau function and other things, depends on extending what are called Fourier analysis or harmonic analysis, in which uh, Professor Atreya is one of the experts in the, this thing, to the context of medical. So it's a very surprising meeting ground, but uh, you need to extend Fourier analysis. See, number theory is a very greedy subject. In order to solve its problems, it doesn't mind what, uh, it, it uses almost all of mathematics. So in some sense, if you want to do number theory, you have to be open to almost all of mathematics. You don't know which aspects of mathematics is going to be used. You have to be conversant with algebra. So we have to be jack of all trades, master of none. But, but you have to be a jack of all things. So, but we have to know this. You have to know how many kinds. You have to know some algebra. You have to know some algebraic geometry. And then it's it's best to keep an open mind. And Fourier analysis is a very very integral part of number theory. Okay, it's extremely important. And in fact, all the various things which one does. Okay, this is what I'm saying. Up to isomorphism, the real numbers and the periodics, they give you all the completions of Q. This is an amazing statement. If you want to look at rationals and you try to look for completions, you are saying it's given by, indexed by primes. The primes don't come into the picture at all. Right? You are talking about an abstract statement. It right? defines a metric on Q, whatever it satisfies, and it complete it as a metric space, whatever. And the only such things are either periodic numbers or the reals. Right? The prime P show, comes out for no stage reason, it's a, the prime is coming naturally. It's not a curiosity that the prime is not useful by something whatever. Okay, last statement. QP is a union of P to the power minus K ZP. ZP is an integral domain and QP is a fractional field obtained by inverting primes P and Z. So what is happening is by going to ZP instead of Z mod P to the power KZ, see Z mod P to the power KZ is a ring which has many zero devices. P is a zero device and Z mod P to the power K. But by going to ZP, this becomes an integral domain and everything is what is called characteristic zero and uh, uh, it's a very nice structure. So it's a very important structure of going from finite fields to what are called characteristic zero fields. Now I want to come to something which is what is the analog of the newton raphson method. I don't know that I got the spelling of Raphson correct. It's probably wrong. Correct, correct. And, uh, uh, what's the time? I don't know that. Okay, but, uh, uh, so the question is, suppose f is a polynomial, and there is an integer b, so that fb is congruent to 0 mod p. So as I said, the solutions mod p, mod p to the power k are considered approximations. Okay, so now we are saying there is an approximation, approximate solution b to this polynomial equation. And I know the derivative is non-zero. That's part of the newton raphson method, right? The derivative should be non-zero in order to do the iteration process. Then, there exists a periodic integer so that, which is a zero for this equation f a, and a zero is congruent to b mod p. The zero part of a of this periodic integer is congruent to b. So it is this solution. So this is, a, this is called the Hensel's lemma, or Hensel's method. And let's illustrate it okay, with one example which is, and the proof of this is very very simple. You can just work it out. You can write for instance with quadratic polynomials or some such thing and then go ahead. But it's extremely simple. It's only involving polynomials and there is nothing more. Whereas newton raphson you have to use Taylor series expansion and other things. You know, you have to know various things about it. This is very simple. Quadratic reciprocity for minus 1 says, which is what we saw, is that P congruent to 1 mod 4, there exists an element such that A naught squared is congruent to minus 1 mod P. I have not proved quadratic reciprocity, but for example, P equal to 5, which is 1 mod 4, A naught is 2 or 3. Okay, so now I am going to get a square root of 4 to the power of 1, which means square root of minus 1. The number i, I am going to 
exhibit it as an integer, as a phi r integer. We complete now the initial approximation, n r equal to 2 to a phi r d square root of minus 1. What do you do? To find uh, c1, I wrote it as c0 plus phi times c1, right? That is how instead of this. I need to say 2 plus phi c1 square should be congruent to minus 1 modulo phi square. Okay, this is essentially the proof of the Hensel's method which I am going through. So this gives you the proof also. If you put it abstractly in terms of polynomials, this is the proof. But you can see. So just extend it. It is 4 plus, I multiplied it but you can keep it simpler. 4 plus 20 c1 plus phi square c1 is congruent to minus 1 mod phi square. So phi square is anyway congruent to 0 mod phi square. So you have 20 c1 and if I take 4 there it is minus 5. It is congruent to minus 5 mod phi square. So phi divides this, phi divides this. I can clear one phi out and cancel out and I will get 4c1 is congruent to minus 1 mod phi. But 4 is minus 1 mod phi. Okay, 4 is the same as minus 1. So which means c1 equal to 1. Okay, now I will continue. c2 satisfied 2 plus phi plus c2 phi squared because I got c1 is 1. Okay, now I take 2 plus phi plus c2 phi squared squared is common to minus 1 mod phi cube. Take that. So I expand it. This is 7. 49 plus 14 c2 phi squared is common to minus 1 mod phi cube uh, because I, this power is, I have left it out. So then 14 c2 is common to minus 1 mod phi and this gives c2 equal to 1. Okay. The 14 is also minus 1. So continue. So what happens is minus 1 plus pi plus phi squared plus pi power k. All the other numbers you can check will be equal to 1. Coefficients of phi. So what you phi power k. So this gives you a representation of y, the fourth power of one. I squared is minus 1. So that has got cut out because I was trying to finish it off at one step. Okay? So let me say this is the number which is represents a complex number i, the imaginary quadratic in the periodic integers of phi minus 1 plus 5 plus, which square is equal to minus 1 inside periodic numbers. If I take its square, it keeps becoming very close to its, each one of them becomes, the, the approximation keeps getting closer and closer to minus 1. Take the squares. So where does that terminate? Ah, sorry? That, that should terminate for some finite k. No, 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 it doesn't terminate. It cannot terminate. Then it will be an actual number. Oh, this is an infinite series. It's an infinite series. It's an infinite series. It's not a regular integer. That's why I gave this. It's a minus square root of minus one can't be a. Uh, oh, it's not a yeah, rational yeah. number. It cannot be integer. So it's a number which is in Q five, which is not in Q. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It does not terminate. It goes on. That's why this. Dot, dot. This is what uh, Avinka says. The polynomial uh, power series is easier to write than a polynomial. <laughs> you put dots and you get a power series. Whereas a polynomial, you have to say what is the last term. Oh, sorry, Avinka student is here. I should not take a potluck. Yeah, but at least it is it's an infinite series with non-negative terms, so it's okay. Yeah, it, yeah. But even if it is uh, general elements of P, will be a lot of power series in P. Yeah. Finitely many terms of two it is for minus negative terms. But okay. So now I want to come to something which is called I started off by trying to say what are local and global. Uh, no, I said initially that uh, if I want to look at solutions of polynomial equations, then I need to say that solutions exist for Z mod P power KZ for all primes P and K. So this is called the local global. Question is whether there exists an integral solution. I did this before I went into PIDICS. This is what I was trying to get at solutions of integral solutions of polynomial equations. And for that, you need to say that by the Chinese remainder theorem, you need to have solutions in Z mod P power KZ for all Z. This is a necessary condition. The question is whether this necessary condition becomes sufficient. Okay. And this is what is called the local global principle. The study of this is the local global. So the, the main local, local global theorem is due to Legendre, uh, the first of the major theorems uh, in, the lo in this local global theorem and that is due to this. So suppose you take ABC of square free integers 
not all of the same sign. So what does this condition mean? If I take this equation, not all of the same sign mean it has a solution in real numbers. Okay, that is the necessary condition. Necessary is a sufficient condition for this numbers. For this equation to have a non-trivial solution in reals, this is all A, B, and C should not have the same signs. They are all positive. Then zero, zero, zero is the only solution. They are all negative. Zero, zero, zero is the only solution. So some of them are to be positive, or some of them are to be negative. Okay, so this is the thing about R, real numbers. Okay, <coughs> right? As a non-trivial solution in integers, if and only if. So I am going to give you various versions of this theorem, starting off with Legendre's version. So Legendre's version is very nice. He says minus AB is a square modulus C, <coughs> minus BC is a square modulus A, and minus CA is a square modulus B. Okay, it's very easy to see. Uh, this take cz squared this side it becomes minus cz squared or or if you want to take uh, so then you will get uh, uh, minus c you can come here when you go for this, uh, for this I, okay I can multiply by b so you will get uh, uh, yeah you'll, if I multiply by b this becomes b squared y squared and then you will get a b x squared plus y squared uh, equal to minus c square minus a b x squared plus y squared equal to b equal to c z uh, is equal to c z squared go modulus c that is zero and then you will you know just like uh, the sign chain when I look for the x squared plus n y squared it becomes minus n x square mod b you know you will get minus a b x square so very simple you can check this out version two okay. So for every prime p dividing a b c, there is a non-trivial solution. That means not all device be divisible by p. Of this, of course, if everything is divisible by p, then this is trivial is zero. Of a x squared plus b y squared plus c z squared. Is okay, right? So I need to check it. Not the p squared, that there is a non-trivial solution. Actually, not. You see, which is version two. I will go from version 1 to version 2, we will be, we'll see what is there. Okay? Version 3, for every prime p and every k, there exists a non-trivial solution, at least one of them not divisible by p, for mod p power k. So version 3 seems much weaker than, uh, you know, it's a stronger hypothesis than version 2. Right? I want to say, I want, this is, you might be saying, I have this, nicer versions, why am I going to this version where I am involving all primes and all integers. I am making it unnecessarily complicated. Right? But the problem is that as I keep going down, the, the theorems look more and more uniform and which is careful of generalization. There is nothing which is very specific. Now it looks like a law that I want to, this is the local global principle. I want to say that a polynomial equation has a zero, if and only if it has a zero mod p power k for every k non-trivial solution. Right? But in version 3, P and K have to be primes? P is always a prime. P is always a prime. P is a prime. K is every natural number. number. K is greater than or equal to 1. P is always a prime. prime. Yeah, yeah, I have been very consistently using P for primes. Only prime. K is, K is natural number greater than equal to 1. Yeah? Right? So for every P and every K, you need to have a solution. This is by the And version 4 is what we have said. You know, if you have this from between version 3 for every p and there exists a non trivial solution, I got rid of k, but in PID conditions at the expense of the PID Okay? So, is this okay? So, I like, so this is the theorem. So, let me just say this. I want to look at this quadratic equation in three variables. So, of course, the motivation for looking at this quadratic equation came from looking at x squared plus y squared equal to n and other things because various quadratic polynomials are considered. So now we want to know whether this has a solution in integers mm -hmm. and uh, out here. And the point is the local global principle is valid out here. If you have a solution in either of this version, mod p power k for every p and k, then and for reals, which is what this solution with this, then it has a solution. That's what the local global. Solutions mod p power k and for reals are considered local. Whereas solutions for Z are considered global. 
Okay, so this is the what the terminology means local global. So this is my interest or integer that's global. Uh, this is T power K. No? This thing comes from manifolds or whatever. Globally, a manifold, if you are doing it on a sphere or whatever there is things, that's called global. Locally, around a point, you are looking at in a neighborhood, that's called local. So, this is like looking in a neighborhood of this point, point T. Rajan, this version 1 and 2 are equivalent by Chinese remainder theorem. Okay, so, so I am saying this 1 and 2 are equivalent by Chinese remainder theorem because if mod C, I am looking at, you look at the primes mod P mod C then it works, uh, you will get a solution mod C, you will get a solution mod P, but if it is a non trivial solution, I can lift it by itself to P square. Okay, so P square to P power K, for P dividing A, B, C, this follows from out here by Hensel again, by Hensel's thing, I can get it from every K. For P not dividing A, B, C, I will give you the argument, what is this thing? It is a very simple counting argument which will tell you there are solutions. And these ones are equivalent by, from here to here I go by Hensel or periodic integers. I can follow, this is, I am not saying these integers are coherent, but once I have got a solution, say for, if P does not divide ABC, if I have a solution mod P, then by Hensel I can lift it all the way to a periodic integer. And for P dividing ABC, if I have a solution mod P squared, I can lift it all the way. And for P equal to 2, I can lift it provided I have solution mod 8 of, okay, mod 4 should be enough. Okay. okay, version 2 implies version 3 for AP dividing ABC by Hensel's method. P not dividing ABC, I am saying this, there are many solutions, take X equal to 1, and I need to find solutions of B by square equal to congruent 1 mod 1 minus C square equal to mod P. Now, how many numbers are here on the left hand side? The squares, there are the non-zero elements will give you p minus 1 by 2 squares and 0 is there, so you will get p plus 1 by 2 squares on this side. The values are p plus 1 by 2. Here is also p plus 1 by 2. But there are two sets of p plus 1 by 2 in a set of cardinal dp, so they have to have a common element and that gives you a solution. Okay. This gives you a solution for p and then you use Hensel method to get a solution for p. Version 3 implies version 4 plus For the reverse direction, from version 4 to version 2, you have a solution of periodic integers, you can knock off the common power of P and you get something which is at least one element in the XYZ is not used by P and that gives you a solution. Okay. So now I am going to give you a, uh, a proof of Legendre's theorem and it is very simple. It's a, uh, it just rests on the Diophantus Brahmagupta identity, which is X squared, I generalize this. This is the identity Brahmagupta uses for the solution of Pell's equation. You can do this. So I have a number which is X squared plus C times some other square. Take the product of two such numbers. Again, I can write it as a square plus C times some other square. Okay? Here X, Y and C are all... All integers. All integers. Or they can work on any ring. You can do this. It's a purely ring theoretical property. Yeah. There are variants of this, you can change signs, etc. In modern language, they say that the norm map is multiplicative. Norm of x plus square root minus cy is you take this number and multiply it by its conjugate. And you know, for a square root, if I am taking a plus square root b, then the conjugate is a minus square root b, so I am taking x minus, and that is this. And one is saying the norm map is multiplicative. This is all that is true. Now I am going to give you an example of a proof of Legendre's theorem in this case. I want to say that. Of course, you might be able to get a solution easily by hand. 7z squared equal to x squared plus 3 by square, but let me give you a solution. Check the necessary conditions. Y model of 3, 7z squared is congruent to x, z squared equal to congruent to, 7 is congruent to 1 mod 3, which is z squared, and that is congruent to x squared. And clearly it has non-zero solutions. z squared equal to x squared has non-zero solutions. Not two. Why? I have to... It's close to 10, close to 11. The next speaker is going for it. Okay, so I don't have much time. Just yeah, yeah, finish soon. Okay. Uh, five, five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, let me finish this proof and just listen. I'll go through it fast. Going on the 7, you get x squared minus 3 by squared equal to 4 by squared equal to x squared. So this also has x squared equal to 2 by squared. This also has a solution. 
Since so this also has non-trivial solutions and all the necessary conditions are same. I won't say the sufficient condition is same. So you take this non-trivial solution model as 7, which is 7 equal to 2 squared plus 3. Right? 7 equal to 2 squared plus 3. And I am going to do all some things there. So what I am going to do is I am going to multiply this equation by 7 and 7 can be absorbed inside this. It will become 7 z squared. And then x squared plus 3 by squared, I will multiply this, but I will use Brahmagupta's identity. I multiply the equation 1, 7 z squared by 7. That is all for this. So if I multiply crudely, I am not going to get anything. It looks this way. But we use Brahmagupta's identity. 7, if I multiply 7 z squared by 7, I get 7 z whole squared on this side. I get x squared plus 3 by squared into 2 squared plus 3. I use Brahmagupta's inequality, inequality equation to get this. This can be rewritten in the form w squared equal to u squared plus 3 by squared. Which clearly has a solution by putting v equal to 0. Then I get w equal to v. So there is always solutions. So this has a rational solution. I go back to this by again multiplying by 7. 7 equal to 2 squared plus 3. And then I get 7 w squared is u squared plus 3 v squared into 2 squared plus 3. And then I get the equation. Okay, I go. It is show follows the original equation as a solution. Basically, what happens is I take this original equation, sound size squared, I multiply by a solution. Since it has solution, this has a solution or PIDX for all p, and this is an actual integral equation. The re remaining e the resultant equation will also satisfy the same hypothesis that it will have a solution for p for all p. By induction, this will have a solution, and I multiply by this equation for 7 to get back to this equation. And again, this has a rational solution, so that one also has a rational solution. It's a very simple thing. It's not more complicated than this. Proceeds by induction and this. The advantage of working with the periodic numbers rather than compared to Z mod P per KZ, so you can take a book like Ireland and Rosen which gives this solution, is that the proofs, the, te the technique of the proof becomes, the details becomes complicated. You'll have to, because there are zero devices and many other things, you'll have to check all these things. Whereas here with periodic integers it becomes easy. Okay, the Legendre theorem can be generalized to the, what is called the Hutch Hasse Minkowski theorem. So you take rational numbers, the quadratic equation a j x i x j equal to zero has a non-trivial solution in rationals, if and only if it has a non-trivial solution in R and P P for every prime. So this means that the local global principle is true for quadratic forms. Okay. So here, you know, I can't go to the version which was given by Legendre or something. It would be very complicated and it would be very difficult to write it down. Whereas this one, anybody can remember it for the rest of their lifetime. You, know, you don't have to remember it. It's just a simple conceptual thing. It just works. Right? And of course, in this modern language, you might be really afraid. But I just told you the proof of Legendre theorem is fairly simple. And actually, it becomes simpler if you use periodic numbers. You go through a bit of difficulty in setting up the periodic numbers, but the proof is very simple and it's given much of what I'm following. If you go and look at Say's book, course in arithmetic, you will now understand how efficiently it is being done there. So, do you have a condition in terms of A, J, XL? I mean, your theorem has a Minkowski theorem. There is no A, J, S are general numbers. Yes. Yeah, I'm just taking a quadratic form. Yes. But so you you cannot give a condition in terms of A, J for a solution to exist. You say if. Oh no no oh yeah that local conditions has to be satisfied. I told you that, no that is not easy. That's not easy. Okay. And it is local conditions. No x squared plus y squared equal to three z squared does not have a solution. You have to check the local conditions. Okay, for r equal to 1 and 2, the theorem can be directly checked. For r equal to 3, this is essentially Lajanda's theorem. For r greater than equal to 4, this is obtained by induction from Lajanda's theorem using a knowledge of quadratic forms and everything. As a corollary, you get the solution in q, if I take 4 squares and things like that. But from q to integers, one can go. You can get Lagrange's theorem that every natural number is sum of 4 squares, and Gauss's theorem that Every number can be written as a sum of three triangular numbers. Again, for details, see Sayer's book. It's not too difficult to go from rationals to integers. Okay, so that is the local global theorem is true in this case, and it's very nice. So now you see, okay, I've finished 
degree 2, now let's move on to degree 3. And now we are completely, uh, it's unknown, it's one of the most difficult problems. It's been there for 50, 60 years and it's not, uh, it's uh, one of the clay millennium problems. One knows, for instance, it fails. The local global principle fails on the nose. There is 3x cube plus 4 by cube plus 5z cube equal to 0. It has solutions mod n for every n, but does not have a solution, multiple solution in the One can show this. However, it is expected that the local global principle is false only up to a finite error. Okay, there is a finite number of possibilities, counter examples in each and every case. I am not going to, to state this because again, some amount of informative knowledge, it is not easy to, it has to be set up. Even for cubic equations, it is one of the two problems, the, what is called the birth unit and direct conjecture. And one knows that if this local global problem is done, then at least in one of the important cases, the rest of the birth unit and direct conjecture is true. Okay, for L because of function groups. So what happens is, in some sense, this seems to be the main stumbling block that the local global principle that it should have finite error to go beyond degree 2 for degree 3 onwards one we don't know what is happening. Okay. It's one of the this is the problem of showing that the shuffle state groups are very because of finite. Okay, I just want to take a couple of slides to say another place where periodic numbers comes in very naturally. Okay. So just uh, I hope this. So you take zeta s, the Riemann zeta function, which everybody knows, and I always show that zeta of 2k is pi to the power 2k times a rational number. Okay. Now actually what happens is the Riemann zeta function as a functional equation, pi to the power minus s by 2 gamma s by 2 times zeta s is invariant under the transformation s going to 1 minus. So what you do, instead of looking at zeta of even integers, use a functional equation to go to zeta of 1 minus 2k, that means zeta of negative odd integers. Okay. So, so you get that, you know, Euler also showed exactly what this rational number is. It's defined in terms of some Bernoulli numbers, which is what this are bk stands for Bernoulli numbers. Zeta of 1 minus k is minus bk upon k, where bk are the Bernoulli numbers, which are defined by the generating series, very explicitly defined. Uh, k by e to the power t minus 1 and you revert 1 minus et and multiply by t so that it does not have a problem. Okay, so this is what is it? bk t power k, uh, maybe I should say b naught is also, that is also b naught, it is k greater than k zero. Okay. And then using, using explicit, you know, you can run this and you can find this. So you get that zeta of minus 1 is 1 upon 12 zeta of minus 3 is minus 1 upon 120, zeta of minus 5 is minus 1 upon 252 and so on. Okay? So this is the zeta values which you can write. At the negative integers, it is all rational numbers. Right? Negative odd integers. Negative odd integers. Negative even integers, it will be 0. Negative odd integers, it is rational numbers. Now, the classical Kumbar congruences states that if m and n are periodically close, then 1 minus p to the power m minus 1 and zeta 1 minus n. So let me say back this 1 minus p to the power m minus 1. I am looking at zeta of 1 minus m and this becomes 1 minus 1 upon p to the power 1 minus m and multiplying by this factor to kill this factor and prime p. That's what is it. So you kill this prime p factor 1 minus p to the power m minus 1 times zeta 1 minus m and 1 minus p to the power m minus 1 times zeta 1 minus m. Remember these are all rational numbers. At negative odd integers, these are rational numbers, but negative, uh, if m and n are even, then they are 0. They are very periodically close. They are, if m and n are periodically close, then these two numbers are periodically close. Okay, this is the place where periodic congruences enters very naturally. And this was done much later, only in the 1960s or 1970s, that the Riemann zeta function suitably corrected. That means you take the Riemann zeta function multiplied by this factor, the factor at p suitably corrected, extends to a continuous analytic function from z p to itself. So this is what is called a, just like Riemann, the, uh, the zeta function is defined at 
natural numbers by summation 1 by n power k and you can extend it holomorphically to real num all complex numbers was done by Riemann and show this functional equation. Whereas now we are extending it to periodic numbers and it has its own different properties, so called the Kumoto Leopold zeta. Kumar was led to studying this congruences in connection with solving Fermat's last theorem for regular prime p. The prime p is said to be regular if and only if it does not divide the numerator of this Bernoulli number of dk for k equal to 2, 4, 6 up to p minus 3. And then Kumar showed that for such things, x power p plus y power p equal to z power p has no non trivial solutions. Okay. So, uh, question, it's not known does there exist infinitely many regular primes? My slides also stop here, but I was hoping to go beyond this if I had the time, but uh, already I have taken, yeah, anyway, it's my end of the thing. Uh, there are other places where periodic things come in very naturally. There are work of Ramanujan on the tau function, whether the multiplicativity of tau, or the size of the tau function, or, or the congruences for the tau function. In all of these places, the periodics come in very, very naturally. No, they are part and parcel of the game. Or, or in generalizing the quadratic reciprocity law to what is called a reciprocity law, the res uh, Artin reciprocity law, again the periodic numbers comes in very naturally in order to make not only the concepts easier to understand, very uniform concepts, but also necessary for the for the proofs and other statements. Okay, so I but I don't have time anyway, it will take me another at least one hour if it's like. Thanks for it.